Little Bit Raid Episode 4. It's me, Hank. It's me, Maggie. We got another five new releases. This will be the first time that we have talked about them with each other ever. Let's do it. Poppy makes weird pop music. She's from Boston. Now she lives in LA. She came up through YouTube. And let's see what we thought about her new EP. Three, two, one. Holy fuck. What? That low? No fucking way, dude. I thought this was mostly pretty just like harmless and catchy. In no world is it either of those things. I mean, this is awful, dude. Nah, I, I thought it was fine. No, this I, is... I will say that I was... I wrote six and then I erased it and put seven because I was back and forth on this, but I think uh, Choke and Voicemail are both pretty good and I think the metal parts on uh, Sweet Mask that have her vocals and not that other dude because that's pretty just like generic bullshit. I think those parts are pretty nice and I think that the song Meat, although it clearly has like a, a political agenda to it, uh, develops a nice enough little like sci-fi world for me to just kind of get lost in it that way. Oof. I just felt completely the opposite about every single thing you just said. I did not believe you gave it a two. I, it, it, this EP fails for me on nearly every level. Um, the production sounds like Diplo heard Arca for the first time and tried to, like, build a, a, a sci-fi concept EP off that. I don't understand most of the production choices. Uh, I thought that the uh, kind of new metal inspired sections of that track, Scary Mask, uh, featuring the Fever 333, also known as the uh, vocalist from that band Let Live, uh, was uh, hackneyed and like borderline offensive to my new metal loving sensibilities. <laughs> um, the riffs were stock. Uh, yeah, the, the parts of that song that were just them were pretty lame, but I thought the parts with her vocals were pretty nice. I just, I, what, what, what I don't understand is that, is, 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 Poppy is like a collaborative project from what I understand between, um, uh, Moriah, whatever her last name is, and, uh, this guy who, who goes by the name Titanic Sinclair. And they sort of, they clearly have, like, like, like you said, like, like the track Meet, clearly communicates like kind of a kind of a it, 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 tra it gestures toward the idea that it has like themes and that there's like thematic sensibilities that go along with this project but i don't understand what they are really um, i thought the symbolism on that was pretty clearly like targeting the meat industry well I, I will obviously sure but like but but i don't i don't get the more than that i don't get the character poppy i don't understand <laughs> what she is i've watched like a lot of the the youtube videos because everybody was freaking out about Poppy a couple of years ago, um, and uh, the music video con or not the music video the her the content of her YouTube videos consists mostly of her like speaking in this disaffected kind of like like very internet kind of kind of means of speaking, um, and there's obviously like supposed to be some themes of like bodily disconnect and things like that. I know sh uh, that they've said she said I think that she's had like some disconnects with her gender identity occasionally. Um, and all of that, like, you know, like on, in the abstract, like makes sense to me, but I don't understand like what this character is supposed to communicate. Um, I don't understand like what the music is supposed to communicate. It's just so slap shot and all over the place that it feels to me like the kind of thing that like a junior in art school would make. I will admit that I, have had zero engagement with her as like a character or a, a personality on YouTube. So have, that did not influence what I thought of her music in any way. But to me, I, I wouldn't even like think to look for anything deeper in this other than some like spooky pop music. Cause that's sort of the vibe that I thought she was going for, especially with how like intentionally hokey I thought songs like voicemail sound. With, yeah. Like the, Poppy is your mommy kind of shit and stuff like that. Yeah. So it's hard for me to think that she's taking herself completely seriously on this and not, like, trying to come off a little bit like her and her fans are in on the joke. This this project to me seems to have, like, intellectual aspirations, at least, like, based on, you know, like, like the content of the videos that I've seen and, like, the, the brief little snippets of interviews that I've read with her. And I, 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 I guess I just, like... 
it doesn't commit enough. It's kind of the same problem that you had with like a hundred gex almost. Uh, but to me, like Poppy feels a lot more of like a cynical, like kind of A and R approach to the sort of thing that a thousand gex or, or that a thousand gex as an album was aiming to do. Um, and it just kind of, the whole thing kind of just winds up ringing hollow. I just want some degree of like artistic integrity and sincerity to what I'm listening to and this just does not feel like it has that. I don't think it has that either. I'm fine with that because I was like coming into it just looking for some like songs about blood and gore sang in like a bubblegum pop style and that's about what I got. And see for me like if I want to if I want to scratch that itch I'm going to listen to the to the Billie Eilish album from this it's done year better. sure. Which which fires on all of those cylinders in a much more satisfactory way with a with a yeah you know, a, a, a pop star behind it who I think is actually, you know, charismatic and interesting and, and brings like a, a, a more unique approach to songwriting. This all just feels a little canned and uh, I don't know, I just don't, I, I think a lot of it also has to do with my skepticism of Mad Decent as a label, um, just because of the sheer amount of the horse shit that Diplo forces into the world every <laughs> three weeks. Uh, and so, uh, you know, obviously that's going to make me inherently distrustful, but, um, yeah, wow. Weird one. Weird one. Weird one. Weird one alert. Weird, weird. Yellow Eyes are a New York-based black metal slash atmospheric black metal. Rare Field Ceiling is their most recent studio album, and let's dig right in. Three, two, one. Fuck. <laughs> this keeps happening. Why do we flip so hard on this in the hand of all I don't know, man. I really loved this. I thought it was really great. I thought this was, every song was one or two solid riffs, and then a bunch of filler riffs in between them. I think you're a fool. That's what I thought about basically every one. Uh, man, the, for... You know, something that is increasingly mattering to me less and less in black metal is riffs. Uh, and something that I'm really kind of finding myself drawn toward lately has been drums. Uh, and I've been paying a lot of attention to drumming on albums. This album in particular is like full of what I think are just wonderful little drum flourishes. Every couple of fucking bars, like, you'll just get like a random open hi-hat or some like alternative percussion, wind chimes bells, uh, things of that nature, and there's just so much to like focus on and pay attention to, um, and I think the drums are so well produced and sit so well in the mix um, that that alone was enough to like keep my attention throughout a lot of these songs. Um, but that said, I really do love a lot of the guitar work going on here. Uh, there was uh, those really uh, wonderful oscillating like arpeggios that are just so classic black metal uh, that uh, you know come through on tracks like uh, let's see a uh, no dust no um, dust is the best track for it, sure how do, uh, just really excellent sweeps uh, and in a way that didn't come across as like too like hokey or like classically black metal influenced you know I think this this album still stands really well on its own. I just thought it ran out of steam because I, I'm honestly surprised that you thought the drums were that exciting because to me I thought it was pretty standard with some like little boom bappy fills here and there and then some uh, offbeat stuff that I thought was really cool the first time they used it but then they went to the well a little too much I thought there in the album. Well you are a drummer so... <laughs> um. And I also thought the vocals are pretty like especially coming off of that Andavald record that we talked about a couple weeks ago that really blew me away vocally. I thought that this one just really didn't do enough to keep me excited. And uh, I also thought just in general, the last couple tracks on this, every time I listen to it, this drug for me. Basically everything I like about this and every riff that I can point out from this that really grabbed my ears from the first couple, especially No Dust, and especially that uh, a drumless opening with, uh, to the third track, Light Delusion Curtain, which I think is the best 30 seconds on the album, if I'm being honest. I uh, personally loved the final track. Uh, I thought that those like uh, choral vocals of Maritime Flair at the beginning were just like, mwah, loved them, loved them. That's going to be, like, weirdly, that is going to be the track that I think I return to the most. I think yeah. it was a really well done ambient uh, I need outro. to hear it more ambient guitar. 
outros on black metal albums. You give me choral vocals, man, and I'm set. That's, that's uh, like all of them have choral vocals. Yeah, but that's like what, but they, 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 they I don't know, atmospherically, this almost kind of fires on some similar cylinders as like the body. Um, and I know that the they're body. all, yeah, <laughs> like, 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 like texturally and like sonically. Um, I think it's a really, it's like, it, it's kind of a suffocating album, which is a vibe that I really like. Um, I just think it's a lot more sinister than that Andabald album was, and therefore for me more texturally interesting. Um, Andabald was a little too awash in those like buzzy kind of typical Atma Black guitars, and and here I, I got I got a lot more clarity to things, but I also felt like the production kept things really kind of menacing and, and sinister. Clarity in the riffs is typically something that I'm going to look for more when I'm listening to black metal because the kind of muddy album black style doesn't do it for me too much. But when that uh, clarity is accompanied with what I thought were mostly underwhelming riffs on the back half of the album, because I do want to reiterate that I think the first three tracks on this are well worth listening to. And if this were just like a little EP of the first three tracks, I'd probably be giving this a seven or an eight. But I just thought with this thing's length, and with having that distinct and open of production, it just kind of highlights that I thought they ran out of ideas after a while. Next up is Mr. Motherfucking Esquire. This is his self-titled release. He's from Brooklyn, New York, and he makes all sorts of different kinds of hip hop. Let's see what we thought about this kind. Three, two, one. This is the hardest decision that I've had to make for a show. Because every time that I listen to this, and it started and I got through the first few tracks, I was thinking an eight. Yeah. And as it went on, I was thinking an eight. But by the end of it, every time, I was just blown away by X's range and ability to recreate versions of himself in an earnest and compelling way. Whoa that excited me every time that I listened to it. Whoa. I think tracks like Rumblefish and the second to last track are amazing pieces of emotional music that got the tears a-flowing nearly every time that I listened to them. I think track, tracks like I Love Hoes are hilarious and display his ability to make his audience laugh. And I think tracks like the first and third track tap into his more aggressive and angry side. And I think all of them, when tied up with the bow of his final speech to his audience in the last track, makes for a very satisfying and beautiful piece of music. I thought it was pretty good. Jute Gate is the solo project of Adam Kalmbach from Missouri. He has released roughly six billion albums uh, all by himself, and uh, he's really into microtonal music. Let's dive right in. Three, two, one. Yeah. Yeah, that's, 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 that's... I was almost going to put a 7, so we're not too far off. I almost gave it an 8. Um, I am a big fan of this project. Uh, I really have enjoyed pretty much everything that I've heard, although that's not saying much given that I've probably heard maybe 10% of his enormous discography. <laughs> um, but, I mean, I generally think... Um, there's one thing you kind of have to keep in mind uh, with with him and a lot of his music in particular that I've heard, which is that it all kind of follows a really similar sort of compositional framework in that you have really avant-garde black metal sections and then long ambient passages and then more avant-garde black metal. But what makes it work for me is that when you say that it's avant-garde black metal, it is like truly yeah, avant-garde yeah. black metal. Like it's not like fucking around. Like, Down oh. to the drums, even. Oh yeah. Oh no. Every yeah, that fucking like polyrhythmic yeah. like like hi hat thing. Yeah. And the, yeah, crazy. And then the it, like he introduces like odd time trap hi hats like toward the end of this like 
there's all sorts of really interesting things compositionally happening here that makes wading through some of those kind of more long withdrawn ambient passages worth it. I actually I actually liked a decent amount of the long drawn out ambient passages, especially uh, the foam that flows from the mouths of wild boars. Excellent. I track. thought it was a very nice track. Yep. Uh, to me, I just didn't like the guitar based dark ambient stuff as much as I liked the more uh, like spooky kind of electronic stuff. almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially that one with like the Lords of Canada vocals yeah, thing on yeah. it. Like that kind of stuff I thought was pretty nice. I just thought that the guitar based stuff got a little bit tedious for me. And even some of the black metal spots I thought drug on a little long. Although there are some killer sections of black metal in this too. Like the entire first maybe like 10 minutes or so, like two thirds of the track dissected grace are just some of the best black metal I've heard this year, I think. The riff on that song is fucking awesome, and the transition between that and the more like bare bones, kind of like drawn out, basic, uh, like drums, vocals, and simple guitar shit, uh, in between the more like out of nowhere, you know, kind of guitar stuff is yeah. really cool. I think like, um, I, I don't even know that there's a case to be made for any other artist when I say this. I really think he's probably the most unique guy doing black metal, um, at least that I've heard. I mean, he some of these riffs are just so completely out there in a way that, that doesn't even always suggest black metal, but still feels like black metal. Um, and... I don't know, I'm just always, and I, and I think a lot of it too is that, and, and, and this is a remark that I've made to several people about Jukeite, his usage of microtonal guitar never feels hokey or put upon or done for the sake of, yeah. you were doing microtonal, it's not King Gizzard and the <laughs> Lizard Wizard, you know. Uh, that's the litmus test. That's the litmus test, because that's like... I don't know, like, like there's, there's, there's kind of a, a, a dearth of artists that are kind of experimenting with, you know, uh, composition outside the, the 12 tones, and um, few of them are doing it in a way that, you know, makes it feel necessary, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and here, it's, it's it, every, you know, you know, quarter note difference uh, feels really measured and, and, uh, and thought about. Uh, but he's also very willing to kind of let loose and just hit you with explosions of sound whenever, you know, the moment calls for it. Yeah, I agree. I think it's got nice sections for both of its kind of dark ambient, industrially spooky shit, as well as its more straightforward black metal, as well as its more all-over-the-place avant black metal. I just think, for me, I would like a little more trimming here and there, and this could have been a favorite of mine. But that being said, if you're a fan of this guy, you'll probably be a fan of this record. And if you're just looking for some out-of-the-box black metal, uh, you'll probably be a fan of it too. And if length doesn't bother you, then you'll really like then it. Then I have a discography for you. <laughs> <laughs> Bandana is getting a ton of attention. It's a release by Freddie Gibbs and Madlib, who are both insanely famous, and you've probably heard of both of them. They have both have lengthy careers outside of this project. This is a follow-up to their record from a couple years ago, Pinata, that everyone loved. Let's see if we loved this one. Three, two, one. Yeah, I knew that that was, yeah. You know, the whole time I was listening to this, I was trying to think about how to communicate what I thought about this album without sounding like a complete, uneducated clod. Okay. But the fact of the matter is, I just do not like Freddie Gibbs. And that's basically the whole reason why it has a lower score. That is strange, because that's the exact opposite reason why this was lower than I thought. Why I gave this a lower score than I had thought. What don't you like about Freddie Gibbs? Okay, so you know, uh... You know how all the reviews have been coming out for that new Lion King movie? And they all basically say that the CGI is like really not emotive and the lions have like the same facial expression during like a dramatic scene of like the death of a family member as well as during like Dance Around with Timon and Pumbaa. Sure. That's what I think about Freddie Gibbs' emotional variety on this album. I think what he's talking about like uh, mistakes he's made with his family, 
he sounds exactly the same as when he's talking about riding around in a Cadillac with his friends. And see, I think that's kind of the appeal of him almost, though, is that he is like, his whole kind of shtick is that he's like a, a really tough, like hard, like streetwise rapper. Um, and I think that almost, to me, makes his more vulnerable moments stick out more because he's, st because he's still rapping with the same inflection as he does when he's just doing, like, turn-up tracks, you know? Um, I guess it's just delivery is super important for me in interpreting how lyrics land. And for me, his delivery is basically the same through the whole album. And also, I, I'm not even that excited about his delivery in general. I think it's very, like, the tone of it and I don't know if it's the way that it's produced or if it's the tone of his voice, but it sounds like it's sitting on top of the mix most of the time rather mm. than sort of getting enveloped in the really jazzy, nice beats that Madlib is putting together. And I think this all really came together in my head when I was listening to the Anderson Pack feature, mm. which I think is the best track on the album because I think that Pack's vocals blend so much better with Madlib's uh, style as a producer and it makes for something that is, like resonates in my head sonically way better, even regardless of any lyrical content. This is interesting because, and, and, and while we, we know how the previous Mr. Motherfucking Esquire review ended up, um, what I didn't actually get the chance to say was that I, while I love and value the, the earnestness with which he delivers his lines uh, all throughout that album, uh, I think that that earnestness kind of uh, occasionally tends to verge on um, a little too performative for me. Um, and what I like about Freddie Gibbs is that he is just a fucking machine gun. And um, while he may not necessarily be super emotive and expressive, uh, his lyrical content for me is just so good. And really, that's surprising. I thought the lyrics on this were pretty like by the numbers and underwhelming. I think he's. I, th I think a lot of you know, the appeal of the Freddie Gibbs and Mad Lib pairing has been that it kind of harkens back a lot, as does Mad Lib's broader production career, to more like classic hip hop. Uh -huh. I know? mean, even just the fact that Gibbs focuses so much on rhythm and doing really interesting rhythmic shit is like a totally like lost facet of Absolutely. That in today's age. Somebody just, I, I think it was in a Pitchfork review where they described one of the beats as like EPMD by way of trap, and I think that was like a perfect fucking analogy for this. Like, the whole thing has notes of, of, of you know, all of those guys. Maybe a little mace, maybe a little, <laughs> um, you know, slick rick. Mm. Um, and I think like, I don't know, I that that's an era of hip hop that I, that you don't often see emulated successfully. Um, and my biggest problem with this album isn't even Gibbs at all. I think he's really kind of the shining star of this. I feel personally like Mad Lib's production was more interesting on their previous collaboration, Pinata. Um, here, I think he almost, and it feels as if maybe it was sort of in an attempt to match his jazzy, breezy, kind of eccentric style with Gibbs's, you know, rapid fire, ultra serious kind of delivery. Um, but I think he almost kind of like reins himself in a little bit to his detriment, um, to the point where I think the beats don't necessarily stick out the same way that they do on other Mad Lib projects, which is the exact opposite of the problem that I had with Mad Lib's other really famous collaborative effort, mm -hmm. Mad Villainy, where I love the beats, I think they're fantastic, I think all the production choices on that are super sound, but I don't give a shit about MF Doom as a rapper. <laughs> uh, and so that album doesn't really land for me quite the same way. Uh, and so it's really strange to see kind of the opposite thing uh, you know, happening here. Uh, I, I I wish that, uh, you know, obviously he, 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 he flips jazz samples really well. There's a lot of really nice jazzy beats here. Um, but there were a couple of moments where he kind of, you know, uh, verges into trap territory and starts introducing some of those. And I, I just don't really give a shit. Um, I, I want to hear Madlib do what Madlib does. And I think what is so appealing about the Freddie Gibbs and Madlib combo is that they're both very this is what I do. Yeah. Um, and to see two very kind of 
different disparate artists kind of try and butt heads together until they find something that works uh, is, is, is an interesting and appealing push and pull kind of dynamic for me. Um, but all that said, I think, I mean, I do understand it because I was a little underwhelmed by this. There's even some points that I, I'm not going to say it's like offbeat because obviously that's not true, but it felt like he was, like Gibbs is almost like struggling to find, like hit the pocket of Mad Lib's beats like on cataracts, I thought especially. Mm -hmm. the Whatever rhythm he's sticking to there just like kind of sounds like jaggedy in an uninteresting way. Like it's just kind of like fighting against the beat rather than locking into the pocket with it really nicely. And I almost wonder how much of that is just like more attempts at like rhythmic complexity that that maybe just aren't necessarily landing. Um, I will say you you did mention something about the uh, the Anderson Pack feature being really good. Yeah. Uh, I uh, this is the first time I've ever liked him on a song. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm really not a fan typically, but uh, I thought he just and, and you're right. He just locks so perfectly yeah, into that beat. That song's awesome. I think uh, Anderson Pack and and Madlib. Potential dream collaboration oh, someday. Yeah. Um, another uh, the the sixth track, Palm Olive. Uh, that's one of the best Killer Mike verses that we've had in, in quite some time. Uh, Run the Jewels really fell off for me in terms of how much I liked that project, but uh, it was really nice to see him returning and doing something that he is really good at, which is just rapping. Yeah, that song kind of like made me really question what I thought about this too, because Killer Mike is another rapper that has a lot more of like a heavy-handed, aggressive style to him. But something about his contributions I thought fit with the beats a lot better. I don't know what, what it could be. I did love Pusha on this as well. Yeah, he was good too. I basically liked every single feature on this more than I liked Gibbs. Especially the one on Education. I thought both of the other rappers on there sounded a lot better than Gibbs did. Well, yeah. I guess the best track that was just Gibbs, I thought, was Flat Tummy T. Flat Tummy T is a great track. And that's track. because that beat matched his vocal style the best by far. It was the most straightforward, it was the most heavy, it was the most hard hitting, and it highlighted what I think he's good at. Every other track to me just feels like he's forcing something that just isn't there. I mean, I know that some of their other stuff has had a lot more features on it, and I think I could get down with Freddie a lot more if he was part of like a, I don't know, a more consistent duo or trio over top of Mad Lib's beats. I think then I would maybe vibe a little harder with that sort of gimmick of having two clashing styles. But as it stands, just like going through like three tracks in a row, it's just him like seemingly struggling to connect sonically, just kind of drags on me after a while. You know what this album needed? Playboy Party. Now it's time for some rapid fire recommendations where we talk about some of the stuff that we have been enjoying this week that wasn't the five albums that we reviewed today. Uh, I guess I'll start. This week and for every week until the end of time, I have and will be listening to Da Baby's Baby on Baby, uh, which is honestly one of the most exciting hip hop mixtapes that I've heard in a really long time. Uh, I've been getting super burnt out on trap music lately, uh, but Da Baby really kind of reinvigorated my love of the genre. It's a little over 30 minutes, and it is just full of nothing but hard hitting trap bangers. Every single track is great. Babysitter, Walker, Texas Ranger, all of them, just fucking hard beats, most of them under two minutes, and rhythmically, he's one of the most talented rappers in trap right now. Highest of recommendations for Baby on Baby. I've also been revisiting Interracial Sex's Forced Bussing, a 62-minute Power Electronics tape that is about the segregation era. It is hard-hitting, uh, it is really intense, and it's supremely listenable for all uh, of its over an hour runtime, which is a fucking achievement in the Power Electronics world. And finally, uh, one a little uh, here's a little piece of life advice that I've been doling out to some folks lately. Uh, watch movies that you know are gonna be bad, because I've been having a lot of fun finding like C, D, and F tier list uh, kind of horror movies 
been enjoying a lot of Hulu originals. I watched the Eli Roth movie The Green Inferno. None of these have been particularly good movies that I would recommend to a lot of people, but it is a really fun way to uh, get a uh, blood and gore fix without having to keep your brain on all the time. Intellectualism is not always necessary, and uh, sometimes you just need to watch some stupid fucking nonsense. The same goes of music, and the same goes of all art. But that inspired me because I wasn't going to say this one, but I agree that watching bad movies is really fun sometimes. And I got a good one for you, The Invitation. It's on Hulu. It's the worst representation of how humans would ra react in a horror movie scenario that I've ever seen. Check it out. Great to have a be few beers and laugh out with your friends. Also, one time in the late 70s, a couple French guys went and saw Star Wars, and they came back out and were so blown away. They made a synth album about it. It's called Star Peace. It's by a group called Droids. It's great, it's catchy, it's boppy. Check it out. Meg, you'd probably hate it, but um, you might like it. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, I've been playing Slay the Spire for so many hours recently. It's like a dungeon crawler, but it's card-based combat. It has a really cool way of adding status effects to, uh, to your character that I really enjoy. It always keeps you coming back because the randomness element is done in a way that isn't really obnoxious and annoying to have to restart your character over and over again. Go for it. Play it. Tell me what you thought. I thought it was good. I'll see you next week.